2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we will be, we are continuing to do our expose now of 2 Thessalonians. And Paul is giving us the information, and he is encouraging these Thessalonians concerning their time of persecution uh, and their time of suffering um, from those that are enemies of the gospel. And we were in chapter 7, I do believe, and it says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And we looked at that idea of revelation thoroughly. And the idea that is given to us is this is not symbolic, it is reality. Uh, It is the reality that those who oppose uh, this wrath of God uh, will will come upon them, and it will be a revelation that is visible, that is personal, that is individual. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you in heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. This second advent, this second descent to the earth, is going to be that of judgment, where God will not come as the Lamb of God in love to to redeem, He's going to come as the Lamb of God, uh, as the King, to execute judgment and bring in His kingdom. Okay? And that's... Huh? And that will be just. Yes. It will be. Um, And still there's grace because there's the gospel. There There is evangelism still. Throughout all the ages... Now, they won't need it in the perfect kingdom, (laughs) right? Because um, uh, that perfection will be realized. Um, But understand that that is is His coming. So, when we're looking at these passages, and we looked at the different ideas, um, He's coming to dispense the judgment of God. So, that is the reality of the situation. And what does that have to do with the issues in this book? Remember that Paul is still mentoring these these believers. They're young Christians still. Got to remember that. Okay? And this these false epistles and these false messengers, I'll call them, to quote unquote, somehow has shaken their foundation of what they were taught. And Paul's main idea here in 2 Thessalonians is the tradition. If you would have kept the tradition I set forth doctrinally and practically, you wouldn't be where you are, right? Uh, They wouldn't be uh, not working and running around uh, from house to house because that's not the tradition that was left to them. We uh, we labor night and day among you and would not be chargeable unto any of you. And as a nurse cherisheth her children, so we, were, so we labored among you. That's the tradition left. They're not following that. And as you can see, the scolding, really it is a scolding that Paul gives them in chapter 2, verse 5, where he says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Do you see that question? But really, that's a rebuke. I told you that... How, you were instructed, <laughs> okay? Um, you were told about all of this. And so um, uh, we see that in verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions, that which is to be handed down, which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Either way. What epistle? First Thessalonians. That epistle. Okay? So... Um, they have been they have been taught, they have been written to, Paul lived among them, they've been instructed, they've been given the example. Okay, so when we come to this introduction, Paul is reminding them of the reality of what is coming ahead. Those things they were all they, they already knew, okay? So he is mentoring them here in 2 Thessalonians. Yes, he's going to correct the error, doctrinally and practically, but notice how he begins the epistle. 
It's not like with the Galatians where he says, I marvel that you're so soon being removed from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ unto another gospel. He's not coming that way. Uh, he's not coming to the Corinthians like he did to Corinthians. Uh, there's division among you. Are you not carnal and walk as men? He's not coming that way. Okay? And I believe that the approach that's used here as born along by the Holy Spirit is that of mentoring them. So, um, understand that even though there's spiritual illumination and revelation, some things take time. All right? That's just reality. Um, I, I, just like with the early church, Jew-Gentile, that didn't take hold right away, did it? After centuries, millennium, really, of they being the chosen people under the promises of Abraham, uh, the, the, the salvation is of the Jews, okay? Uh, we see that in the early church, that didn't break down right away, and I shouldn't say break down, that was not accepted. That was not, uh, that, that grace gospel, there is no difference. All have sinned, all come by grace through faith, right? And even though Peter preached that, at lunchtime, later on, when he was sitting with the Greeks, the Jews came in and he and Barnabas and the rest got up and left. Right? So that, that didn't get settled historically, really, as we understand it, even to the first century. That was a battle. Okay? So you're dealing with, with people. And we all have a little apostate running around inside of us. Like it or not, Adam is there. And so, let's understand that. So, our, the apostle here, I believe in this approach that we are looking at, he is establishing the spiritual reality of things. And he's mentioning them that, that have been troubling them. Look in verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And I believe that that is directed to those Judaizers specifically. I think they're the ones that were sitting around this false epistle and uh, were giving these, these this, this false, handing out this false doctrine, running around in behind Paul. Uh, I think that's what was going on there. Okay, so um, let's look at another example of that, only in. Um, more definite terms. Look in the book of Galatians, for example, chapter 5, verse 7. Now, I don't believe that these Thessalonians were removed from the true gospel like the Galatians were. I don't believe that was it at all. Um, I believe that, that as young believers, uh, they weren't putting things together. <laughs> they just weren't. The Galatians, this was a compelling to please men. And I don't see how that that is the Thessalonican mind at all. Because as the introduction tells us, we see the love for the brethren. We see the laboring and enduring. Uh, we see all of that going on. Now we don't see that in Galatia. Galatia. Um, they, they don't want to have anything to do with the offense of the cross. That's not for them. Okay? So they were out to please men. But look in Galatians, that idea of troubling um, let's look in chapter 5, verse 7. Ye did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? And that's what this epistle is about, the truth of the gospel. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. We know about that principle all the way through Scripture, don't we? We studied it concerning the Passover. There was to be no leaven in the house those 14 days, right? I have confidence in you through the Lord that that... Ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that what? Troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would that they were even cut off who what? Trouble you. Uh, them's, them's fighting words, don't you think? That's taking the sword and, and dividing, isn't it? Uh, they were cut off. And, and Paul meant that. Okay? Um, that idea of troubling. 
And we have that same idea running here, not quite the same word, but in verse 7, and to you that are troubled. There were those that were troubling them. In verse 6, um, God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. All right. Now, we move forward here in verse 7. Now, this revelation is from heaven. You always want to consider the source of a revelation. And here, Paul is, is defining it is from heaven. It's not from man. It's from heaven. That's, its, um, that's the source of the locality. It's from heaven. Uh, verse 7. From heaven with His mighty angels. This, when this revelation comes, it's coming from where? Heaven. And this is the central focal point of this revelation and unveiled appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ to the earth in that day. That's eschatological language. In that day. You'll see that expression used in the Old Testament quite a bit. In that day. Uh, and it is usually used in, in reference point. Um, uh, literal place, heaven, as referred to here. Our Lord Jesus Christ would have it so. Uh, it's with the angels of power. That's how that ought to be translated. With His angels of power. Um, angelology is a very interesting study. I know that it includes Satan and his angels as well. But these angels are ministering spirits. They are known for intelligence and for power. Um, let's look in the book of Matthew chapter 24 for just a moment. Matthew chapter 24. And let's look in verse 29. Matthew 24, 29. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ is um, telling us about the end times. That's what the disciples were asking about. Uh, they were not asking about the church. I don't think the disciples were clued in about the church. Remember? They were fighting over to have the chief seats in the kingdom right hand and left hand. Remember, that was their quest. Uh, it was not about the church. So look in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give its light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Why is he telling them these things? Tell us the signs. He's answering their questions. I, I don't know why everybody makes this so difficult, and they want to throw the church in here. I have no idea why they do that. Okay, This is the king of the kingdom. That's Matthew. He's answering the disciples' questions. He understands what their question is about. And that's the times he's talking about. Okay? Simple. Keep it simple. Okay? Then and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and what? All right, I don't know how we can make it more clear. I don't know why everybody gets thrown off by that. Okay, right? It's simple. In heaven, clouds, mighty angels. What's so hard about that? <laughs> okay. Um, and He shall send His angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, again, eschatological language, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, what elect people? Israel. The church is not on the earth during the great tribulation. We're not looking forward as a covenant promise, I better be careful when I say this. Of course, we're looking for the covenant promise to be fulfilled of the kingdom on the earth. Of course, we are. 
but not as the Jew is. Okay? We're citizens of heaven. We're the heavenly people. Let's put it that way. All right? We're the heavenly people. We reign with him wherever he is. <laughs> okay? Whether it's in heaven, on the earth, in the new heavens, new earth, new, new king. Matters not. We're the bride. Our place is with and beside Christ. We're the bride. Israel is the earthly people. Promise to them is land, a holy land on this earth. Now that's not us. That's them. Okay? So that elect... From the four winds. Why? What language is that? They've been scattered. Wind pushes things. It scatters things. Or, and if you want to look in Daniel, four corners of the earth. Okay, Same idea. That has to do with Israel being scattered among the nations. He's going to what? Bring them back. He's going to put that remnant. He's going to have that remnant. That's what Elijah didn't understand ages ago. Was the remnant... Uh, election of grace, the remnant. God always has a what? Remnant. Why? Promises. The promises have to be secured somewhere. I, I, I don't mean to be over logical, but <laughs> got to put it somewhere, right? So there's always a believing remnant. Okay? Now verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. All right, and, and we get into the parables, but I, what I wanted to do was just show you this. Um, let's look in chapter. Um, let's look in chapter twenty-five, verse thirty-one. Chapter twenty-five, verse thirty-one. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory with all the what? Holy angels with Him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Notice, these, these angels are designated by the word what? Holy, not the fallen ones. The holy ones. Okay? And before him shall be gathered all the nations, and he shall separate one from another, as a shepherd divideth sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Who is on his right hand? The sheep. Now, this is Jehovah Raha, the good and great shepherd of his sheep. My sheep what? Hear my voice, and I know them. And they shall what? Follow me. <laughs> All right, that's the plan. <laughs> that's always been the plan. Okay? It's always been God's prerogative to dwell among His people. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And I will dwell among them. That's the theocratic principle it has not changed. It will be brought into fruition perfectly in the new heavens, new earth. Okay? When the kingdom, the new Jerusalem comes, it will be perfectly realized. The sheep. That's the shepherd's people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, okay. It doesn't to some. Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you since when? Since the foundation of the world. What is that? That's God's sovereign, gracious election. Are you following that? It is the same as if you read it, same effect as if you read it in the book of Ephesians or in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter chapter 1. From the foundation of the world. Referring to the Christian, the church elect. Same principle. These are his elect. Okay? For I was hungry and ye gave me food. I was thirsty, ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, ye took me in. That's what God's people do. Okay? They're doing the works that God's people will do. 
It isn't that because they did these works, oh, they get to enter the kingdom because of the works they did. If you want to say that, then you're going to have to take out the phrase from the foundation of the world. And you'll have to put in the phrase, well, according to your works. It is the same principle of his divine election by grace. Where God's what? Poema. Prepared unto every good work. The works is a result of the grace position. The grace standing, the election. That doesn't change here. Just because we're talking about prophecy, that doesn't change. Okay? And remember that all prophecy is about Jesus Christ. He's the, um, Jesus is the testimony. The testimony of prophecy is Jesus. Okay? We're told that in the book of Revelation 19, verse 10. Okay? For I was hungry. All right, now look in verse 36. Naked ye clothed me. I was sick, ye visited me. I was in prison, ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord... When saw we thee hungry, fed thee thirsty, gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? And when saw we thee sick, or in prison, came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my... Ah! Ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, he cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He shall know them by their works. Same principle. The elect are acting from the grace standing, and those that are not the elect, the nations to be judged, by the way, um, are acting according to their standing. Okay? Okay? So don't make this something that it's not. Read it. Read it. Okay? So I don't know why I went into all of that. Anyhow, I guess I get upset with some of this stuff. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know why people twist and turn and act like the church might be in there. It's not happening. Okay? My point is that he will appear with his what? Mighty angels. His angels of power. Um, let's look in the book of, of uh, Matthew chapter 26 for just a moment. Alright, let's look in verse 52. Matthew 26, 52. Then said Jesus unto him, this is Pilate, I'm sorry, uh, this is Peter, I apologize, this is Peter. Then said to Jesus unto him, put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than what? But how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled, and thus it must be? Boy, what a powerful statement concerning the Scriptures and the power of the Scriptures and the authority of the Scriptures. I don't know what Peter thought he was going to do. He's going to take them all on? <laughs> I guess. And this is what happens when a fisherman is given a sword, I suppose. But... Um, our Lord had to uh, put that away. That's not how this is going to be done. Yeah, the kingdom's going to be brought in by way of the cross, Peter. Put that thing away. <laughs> right? Um, in the same hour said Jesus unto the multitudes, Are ye come out as against the thief with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hand on me. Of course, they couldn't. But they didn't understand that. But that was their desire, wasn't it? We, we see throughout the, the gospel, they were seeking how they might destroy him. They needed the, the right scheme at the right time, in other words. And all that was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled, then all the disciples, what? What? 
You know, that, this discipleship always amazes me. So if we can't fight and cut everybody up with the sword, I guess we're leaving. I don't know. <laughs> Figure it out, right? Um, I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any logical. You'd think if you were uh, loyal uh, to the king of the kingdom, you would stand with him, wouldn't you? I'll tell you what happened. They saw their chief seats fading fastly away. Okay, that's what the problem was. Their program through Christ was diminishing. Okay? This is why they fled. Um, now, let's look uh, for just a second. Uh, let's look at verse 53. Twelve legions of angels. And believe me, it wouldn't take that many. Let's look in chapter 26, verse 54. We're working on that idea of power. Power. And if you've looked at, if you've studied angelology, you will see that these angels have immense power. So we need to, to get the Warner Brothers idea out of your head and the little devils with pitchforks, red little devils with pitchforks, get that out of your head. We're talking about very powerful spiritual beings. Both ways. Demonical as well as holy. Both intelligent. Okay? Look in verse 54. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto thee, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Oh, that's going to do it. Boy, our Lord knew what buttons to push, didn't He? A healing on the Sabbath. <laughs> he knew what buttons to push. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Well, they were false witnesses anyway, and none of them would agree, so a lot of good those guys were doing them. Behold, now ye have heard this blasphemy. What think ye? And they answered and said, He's guilty of death. Well, they already determined that already. And there's nothing like due process, right? <laughs> there's nothing right about this, all right? Then they spat in his face, buffeted him, and the others smote him with the palm of their hand, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who smote thee. And then we go on into Peter's great, great um, the temptation and failure. Okay, but I want, I want to point out is how these angels are referred to. Holy angels. Power. Uh, he is Lord of hosts. Our God commands a powerful, uh, heavenly, mighty army. It wouldn't take 12 legions of angels, trust me. Remember the angel that went through Egypt. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Remember studying that? We have a death angel. And he executed and every firstborn of everything was dead in the morning. It didn't say angels, plural, angel, singular. Got that all done through the whole empire of Egypt one night. It wouldn't take 12 legions of angels. Okay? So we have examples of this. Um... All right, so in flaming fire, fire is characterized. Uh, the, the idea of a flame has to do with, with burning. It, can, it has several ideas to it. Um, one is judgment, that's obvious, and that's what's implicated here. Um, one can be sanctification. It can be sanctification. Um, for instance, um, it's characterized by a flame burning bush. Take off thy shoes from off thy feet, for this is what? Holy ground. Okay, so let's look in the book of um, Acts. Book of Acts chapter 7. And let's look in 29 through 33. 
Acts chapter 7, verse 29 through 33. Then fled, Mos- then fled Moses at this saying, and was a sojourner in the land of Midian, where he begot two sons. And f- when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of what? Fire in a bush. <clears throat> we get a little more commentary than we see in Exodus here. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, All right, um, so that's an idea, literal meaning to it in, in the word presented. And the reason I wanted to bring this to you was for you to appreciate these holy angels with flaming fire. Not unusual for God to use that in other instances. I just want you to think about that, that idea for just a second. Let's meditate on that for just a second. Remember when Israel said, we loathe this light bread. What, was, what, was, what, came, on, what, came, what came about as soon as they said that? Fiery serpents. Now I believe that's literal. And I believe they're fiery serpents for a reason. I think God got it across to them that this was judgment for their disobedience. Right? Uh, just, that, just that idea of flame of fire. We see fire used constantly concerning the sacrifices, especially the burnt offering, to be totally consumed. That having to do with what? Holiness. Holiness. So uh, we, we have holiness, we have the presence of God, we have judgment represented when we see flame of fire. Okay. Um, Let's look in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2 for just a second. 2 Corinthians. The idea of clouds. When we see these great clouds, uh, many times we, we see the, the, the presence of God and the, great, um, the greatness of a, the greatness and majesty of God. Um, the idea of a cloud... Um, when our Lord ascended, this same Jesus that you see taken up, uh, we, when we see this great cloud, uh, we think of the great cloud of witnesses in the book of Hebrews, don't we? 12, 1 and 2. Um, when we see this great cloud, remember the cloud that during the day, as we know from the book of Isaiah, had to do with the appearance of God, the presence of God. Uh, the cloud that filled the temple, the cloud that filled the tabernacle. Okay? Uh, we have that same idea. Uh, notice, if you will, here, <coughs> in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 and 2. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. Um, so when we're, when we're looking at this, this statement, let's understand a literal translation. In the heavens, great cloud, powerful angels, flaming fire. It's literal. It's a literal appearing. Okay? That's what's coming. And their intention is mentioned to us. Taking vengeance and their target is mentioned. On them. (laughs) Those that are troubling you, this is what's going to happen to them. Why are we looking at this? Because those that were sending out the letters, those that were persecuting them, those that were trying to lead them astray, God has plans for them, unless otherwise saved. Right? Right? God has plans for them. So let's go back to the book of 2 Thessalonians. Um, it, if, if you and I were standing there and getting this letter, and it's being read to us, I, I want you to, to kind of uh, put yourself in their sandals, so to speak, back in that day at that location with this going on in your church, and Paul's written you a letter. Okay, It is inspired of God. It's an epistle of God. 
and this is what you're told, what would that mean in reference to what is going on? Well, those that are troubling us, God is going to appear. And there's going to be judgment. From heaven, great cloud, mighty angels, flame of fire, and He's going to do what? Take vengeance on them. So why should we be listening to these letters? And listening to this false doctrine coming from them. See the plans God has for them. You get the idea? So look in one eight, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. This knowledge is, this, and that word is played on a lot in, the, in that era of time. We see the word know a lot. You should go to the, the concordance and see how many times the word know comes up. <laughs> and that, remember, there was that, that philosophy of Gnosticism. Gnosis. The know-it-all guys. They had the corner of knowledge. So that's played on a lot. And it's very interesting how unbelief is described. They do not know Him experimentally by faith. There isn't the spiritual revelation, manifestation, illumination, intelligence of God. Okay? And second, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's their standing. That's why this vengeance is coming on them. Revealed from heaven. Great cloud. Mighty, powerful angels in flaming fire taking vengeance. This is why. It's the same people that are, no, that are, that are described as troubling them. Are you making the connection? Okay. Uh, this is the purpose of the retributive holy legislative justice of God. Inflicting vengeance, vines rendering vengeance, inflicting vengeance, and we must note the difference between human and divine vengeance. Human vengeance is based on a sense of injury or merely out of feeling of indignation. Uh, on the part of God, it is accomplished based on His holiness and righteousness with no self-gratification or vindictiveness. It, um, this vengeance, when we hear the word vengeance, we immediately, we immediately feel or think of what? I'm going to get them back. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? That's vengeance. Right? When we, when we talk about the vengeance of God, okay, uh, it is retributive action. It is punitive, but it is not enjoyed. Its motive is not self-gratification. They got me, so I'm going to get them back. Okay, that's not, a, that's not a holy God talking there. That's not holiness, is it? And that's certainly not a God of grace, because He is both. Okay? So when we talk about the vengeance of God, the target happens to be the unbeliever because he doesn't know God and he will not obey, submit, under. That word's a military word. It's used in the book of Romans as well. To the obedience of faith. It includes believing, but it also includes humility and it includes a... A, 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 a submission. Okay? So, let's, uh, let's be careful with the word vengeance for a minute. And let's look in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Romans 12, verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. That's why we don't get in the vengeance business. Uh, when we begin to gratify self with punitive action, we move away from the holiness of God. You cannot be an acceptable sacrifice, holy, acceptable, which is your divine reasonable service, and be taking vengeance on people. 
can't, can't, be, can't be doing those two things at the same time. A, a, a living sacrifice is not running around taking vengeance on people. It's a contradiction in terms, isn't it? And that's what this so-called practical section falls under. No, you're a living sacrifice. Okay? Um, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. That's God's department. And it will be done in holiness and righteousness when He does it. It will be done punitively, definitely. Uh, probably, if I can say this word, consummatingly, if that be such a word. Um, it'll be done right, okay? And it'll be done totally. But it'll be done in holiness and righteousness. Uh, we, 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 we're not going to see God in heaven saying, <laughs> I got them unbelievers, you know. No, that's not what you're going to see from God. Okay? Now, the human mind would do that. Human gratification. Uh, and I've even seen believers so, go so far as to say, well, he got his. You know what? You, you've stepped in the wrong lawn. You're in the wrong yard, man. You've, you've trespassed there. That's not for you. Thank God. God's going to do that. Yeah, but he did me wrong. Well, probably they did. And certainly these, these were folks who were doing wrong to these Thessalonians. And it was, it was done um, well planned. <laughs> okay, There's a, there was a plan here to throw them off. And uh, to do damage to this church. And what better way to do it? Okay. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful doctrine to mess people up on, okay? Um, it, it, was, um, it was calculated. It was calculated. Um, they really had to dig into to Paul's doctrine to, to get at them. I mean, it, they really put a lot of effort in this. You've got to admire the enemy, you know? Um, wow. <laughs> okay, but uh, it, what is our position? We give place. Commit that to him that judgeth righteously. Move on. We move on. It isn't that we're wimps. It's because we know what's coming. <laughs> that's that's going to be handled. <laughs> okay? That's going to be taken care of. So, um, let's look here, if you will. Uh, this is the purpose of the retributive legislative, and it is not vindictive, as we just saw in Romans 12, 19. Let's look in Revelation chapter 16. The basis of this is spiritual, not, not emotional. Uh, and if you look in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, let's look at verse 1. Revelation 16, 1. Why is God going to judge this earth and judge these people this way? Sin! Sin! God's going to destroy sin. Sin! One way or the other, it's going to get judged. So look in Revelation 16.1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now let's look, if you will, in verses 4 through 7. And the third angel poured out his bowl upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. Kind of reminds you of Egypt, only on a more massive level. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, who art, who wast, and shalt be, because thou, wast, thou hast judged thus. And they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. That doesn't mean there isn't irony in God's judgment. Okay? Um, it kind of reminds me of when Moses came down off the mount. Well, you like this calf so much, what did he do? He ground that calf up, put it in the water, and said, drink it. Okay? <laughs> um, I know Moses was the meekest man on the earth, but he had his moments. Okay? Uh, that rod thing kind of got him in trouble too, didn't it? Oops. Yeah, but look in verse 7. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous... 
are thy what? That's why you're told ahead about it. It isn't that something hits God and He says, all right, that's it, I'm going to get them. No. You're told about it already. And you're told why. It's mapped out in detail for you. Because God is holy and righteous. And when He created man, He created man to worship and commune with Him. So here in our context, it's said of the act of divine justice, which will be meted out on those who know not God and obey not the gospel. This would be the reason of his vengeance. So I want to leave that with you. I know that's a tough place to leave us, huh? <laughs> and we'll, we'll take this up the next time we're together. But as we're looking at this passage, I want you to think about Calvary for just a moment. Because it's no different there. God's holiness and righteousness and condemnation against sin was poured out on Christ at Calvary. That those who would believe on Him would have their sin forgiven as it's been taken justly. The just Die for the unjust. Sin paid for. Holiness satisfied. Men redeemed. When we're reading these portions of the Bible, let's not make the mistake of the humanistic view. Uh, we get that a lot from neo-orthodoxy and the new evangelism. Well, oh, my God is not like that. He's a God of love. He wouldn't do that. They make Him a love, a Greek love God. God is holy, and that cannot be compromised. God is a God of wrath, and He will, he will judge it with vengeance. And He has, and He will. And He is. The wrath of God abideth upon them. It's kept in store, Romans tells us. Under the day of what? Judgment. Okay? But it is because of His righteousness. It is because of His holiness. Okay? So this vengeance will be meted out literally. And for these reasons. And upon this objective. Let's, let's end with a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we do praise You and thank You for who You are this morning. We thank you that you are indeed a holy and righteous God, that there is none like you. Father, we praise you for your grace and your loving kindness to us that are in Christ Jesus. These things we praise you for in Jesus' name. Amen.